Hello, thanks so much for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get to hear from one of WWF's very own experts. We're happy to have you all here. My name is Kate. I will be the host of the event today. And I would like to first kick things off by introducing our featured presenter for today. Her name is Giovanna Grine. She is a senior program officer with the Wildlife Conservation Team here at WWF US. And today, Gia is joining us to teach us a little bit more about a very unique animal that many people don't know much about, but is in desperate need of our protection. Of course, we're talking about pangolins. So Gia, thanks so much for being here. We're really excited to have you. Thanks, hey, Kate. I'm excited to be here and to see all of you that are joining on camera. So before I pass things over to Gia, I just want to take a moment to say hi to everyone that is joining us today. For those of you that are watching from the webpage, you should see a chat box underneath your screen there, underneath the video that you can use to introduce yourself and place any questions that you have for Gia during the presentation. Just as a heads up, you do not have to wait till the end of her presentation to ask your question. You can place your question in that chat box at any time, and we will do our best to get as many questions answered at the end as we can. So we are also really excited to have two classes joining us live on camera today. So teachers, make sure you're by your computers to hit unmute on your microphone so you can say hi. Joining us from Lynchburg, Virginia, we have Miss Humphrey's class. How are you guys doing? I'm okay. I know it's going to be a little more to hear about this. We're doing great, and um, we've been in school ever since the start, so hopefully we'll stay that way. <laughs> Wonderful. We're happy to have you. And I'll, I'll join us. Um, Ms. Um, Humphrey, go ahead and put your microphone back on. There you go. Um, also joining us from Grover Hill, Ohio, we have Ms. Baker's class. How are you guys? Good. <laughs> We are very excited. We've been studying our pangolins and we're really anxious to learn a lot more. Wonderful. So happy to have all of you here. Gia, I think if you are ready, we are ready for you. So if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and get started, we are ready. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so let me load this up here. Can everyone see uh, this main slide image here that matched what Kate had on the screen? Just give me a thumbs up in the window. Awesome, okay. Um, well, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Giovanna Grine and I'm a senior program officer with World Wildlife Fund. Um, really excited to be catching up with all of you today, whether you're in the classroom or at home. Uh, today, we're gonna be learning about this awesome creature here called the pangolin uh, and what we're doing at WWF to help protect them from illegal wildlife trade. Um, and I know some of you have been studying penguin in your class, and Ms. Baker's class has just said that. Um, so hopefully I can share some new information um, and you can you know, chime in with anything cool you've been learning later on in the session. So to give you an idea of what we'll walk through today, um, first we'll just start off with a little more information about who I am and how I got started in this work. I'll introduce you to this really awesome character here named Lynn. We'll learn a little bit more about what is a penguin um, and why is it important to protect them. We'll talk a little bit about um, WF and our work to help keep penguins safe in the wild. And then most importantly, um, help you all understand how you can help us protect penguins. And then we will open up for questions. And as Kate said, please feel to kind of feel free to send those along as we're going. So how did I end up at WWF? Um, if any of you tuned into my last session a few months ago, um, you'll know that my original background was in environmental education. So much like your amazing teachers that signed you up for um, this session today, uh, I really wanted to share my love of nature and wild places um, with students all over the world. And so after getting a degree in environmental science and education, um, I was fortunate enough to do some really cool jobs and internships um, to get a little bit of field experience and also some really cool education experience. Um, so I worked at um, a local aquarium where I was able to educate users all about the cool animals that worked there. Um, and was able to swim with a giant sea turtle and some sharks, which was both scary and really cool. Um, I got to develop um, a lesson plan on how um, climate change is affecting Great Barrier Reef in Australia. 
I traveled to Costa Rica, which is this bottom right image here, uh, to learn more about um, conservation practices that were happening on the ground in the country. Um, and they were doing some really cool work. Uh, I slept uh, next to howler monkeys, which sound a lot like dinosaurs. I invite you all to go check those out on YouTube. Uh, crazy sounding monkeys. Um, and visited a sloth rehabilitation center, which was really cool to see um, some of these different conservation activities that were on the ground that I had only been learning about in school. And then I decided I wanted to pivot a little bit um, and work with really big companies to help them be more sustainable and help them care a little bit more about nature as well. Uh, so I went to business school and found that kind of my background with environmental science worked really nicely with a business degree for the role that I would then go on to do at WWF. And so I've been with WWF uh, for seven years now, uh, maybe just a little bit longer than that. And I started out as an assistant while I was getting my degree in graduate school um, and had a really supportive team um, that worked with me while I was getting my degree and then helped me transition into, into program work that aligned really closely with my interests. Um, and this will go on, I'll talk to you about some of the really cool work I've been working on today. Uh, and through this job, I've been really fortunate to travel to some amazing places around the world. Um, I'm actually just mindful I did not turn on my audio when I shared my screen. So let me do that so you can hear um, audio as I go on to share. Let's see, check the button. Okay, and we're back. <laughs> this was just elephants. Um, but so this was um, a trip I took to um, Thailand a few years ago now. And it was the first time I saw elephants um, in the wild, which was just amazing. Um, we'd been driving around looking for them and followed a really excited rooster down a path that led us to this really beautiful family of elephants. Um, with a little baby calf in tow as well, which was just really magical to see, especially for the first time. Uh, but the nice thing about my role at WWF is I don't have to be in a remote part of the world like this um, to help protect species. I'm able to do it all from my desk um, right in Washington, D.C., um, or right now in Maryland, just outside of the office while we're working from home safely. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and while I wasn't fortunate enough to see a pangolin in the wild uh, when I was uh, in Asia, um, I have a really cool friend here who can tell you a little bit more about the species. My name is Lynn, and I want to star in a movie. Why is that artichoke talking? I'm a pangolin, which basically means my tongue is longer than my body. And I'm pretty much for a bowling ball. Oh! But... The pangolin piece de resistance? We're the only mammals with scales. Pretty neat, huh? Poachers think so, too. You see, people use us for traditional medicine. And leather boots. The situation is critical. Averaging about 100,000 goodbyes a year. I have to do something. I have to star in a movie. If I become famous, pangolins will become famous. People will notice us and finally care about us. So guys, help my species become known. In Hollywood, let me star in a movie, please! So that was Lynn um, from a really fun campaign WWF has been working on that you can learn more about um, at worldwildlife.org world slash save the pangolin. But now that you've heard a little bit from Lynn, um, let's dive in a little bit more to learn what a pangolin actually is. Uh, so while they may look a little bit like a dinosaur, um, pangolins are actually mammals, which means they are warm-blooded with a backbone, just like us. Um, they have some sort of fur or hair and also nurse their young. There are eight species of pangolin in the world. Uh, we have four in Africa and four in Asia, um, and all are protected under international law. Uh, species is nocturnal, which means they sleep all day and they are up during the night, um, so definitely would not want them as a pet. Um, and while we have these beautiful images of penguins here, um, taken by some really talented wildlife photographers, penguins are really elusive, um, which means they're really difficult to find um, in the wild. So, so seeing them in person or being able to take a, a picture of one is quite difficult. So what really makes penguins unique um, are these scales. They're covered um, kind of head to tail in these hard uh, keratin scales. So this, uh, this keratin is made of the same thing as your fingernails. Um, and they're the only mammal that are covered um, fully uh, from head to toe in these scales. Um, and this is also why they're an issue in illegal wildlife trade, which we'll go on to talk about in a few moments. Uh, penguins have these long sticky tongues, which Lynn showed you. <laughs> um, it's to help them pick up the food that they eat like ants and termites. Um, even though Lynn had a really great uh, set of beautiful teeth in our animated video, um, penguins actually don't have teeth. Uh, teeth, Lynn just popped those in for Hollywood. Uh, but you, do, you can see here that the um, penguin has some claws that they can use some digging around to help them dig up some of those bugs. 
And when pangolins feel threatened, um, their defense mechanism is to roll up into a ball and kind of wrap themselves in this, this hard armor to protect them from predators. Um, and this can be hard enough um, to sometimes even help prevent, um, you know, like a lion or something from eating them. Um, there are some funny images of, of them just trying to bat them around and not being able to, to penetrate those scales. And they actually got their name um, from the Malay word for roller, um, since they kind of roll up into a ball for this defense mechanism. Unfortunately, though, um, this being their defense mechanism, you know, may work well for, for a large predator, uh, but not against humans and illegal wildlife trade, which is where we come in. So how are we protecting pangolins from illegal wildlife trade? The illegal trade uh, in wildlife refers to, um, so if anything is illegal, it means um, there's a law saying that you should be able to do it, kind of like wearing your seatbelt, there's a law that you have to wear it, and if you don't wear your seatbelt, it's illegal. And so with animals, uh, particularly endangered species, uh, there are unfortunately people around the world that like to either own really exotic um, endangered species as pets, um, or have products that are made from their parts. And a lot of these animals are protected under international law. And so it makes, it makes the trade in these, um, in these animals and their parts illegal. Um, and the pangolin uh, is a species that's been hit kind of one of the hardest by this global trade, um, even though many people hadn't even heard of the pangolin until the last year or so. Um, so just last year in 2019, an estimated 195,000 pangolins were trafficked um, or illegal trans illegally transported for this trade um, in 2019. And this is just for their scales. Um, pangolins are in demand for some other um, parts, which I'll go on and say in a minute. Um, but this data is just looking at scales, so the number is likely much higher. And this is an example of what those, those scales look like. And then kind of looking be, uh, a little bit further back, not just in 2019, an estimated 1 million pangolins were trafficked over a 10 year period. Um, and again, this, this number is likely very low. Uh, they are difficult even to find, you know, when they're alive, they're very elusive, but when it's in trade, it's so much harder to track. Um, and some of the seizure data that's come out over the last few years, um, there've just been, you know, 50 ton seizures coming through um, with just thousands and thousands of, of animals. So this number is likely very conservative. So pangolins are in demand um, kind of from head to toe um, a little bit. So their scales are, are primarily what they're traded for. And those scales are ground down and used um, in traditional medicine, as, as Lynn was saying here, um, with some alleged um, medicinal cures for things like asthma and arthritis. Um, and that has the, the greatest value, unfortunately, for, for the trade is for their scales. They're also in demand for their leathers, um, which are used to create, um, or sorry, for their skins, which are used to create leather products. Um, so like cowboy boots or bags or belts. Um, for those of us in the United States, um, those are the most common pangolin products that we see. Um, and the pangolins are also in demand as well um, for consumption as a delicacy in, in high-end um, restaurants in parts of Asia, they are consumed. So what does the internet have to do with it and why do I spend so much time online throughout the day? So we've seen um, sellers are really starting to sell illegal um, wildlife and their products online. Um, so like all of you, I'm sure are aware now, it's very easy to get um, kind of anything you want online around the world from all of your favorite um, online platforms. Uh, so whether this is a traditional buying platform where you would go to buy, you know, everyday things um, or social media platforms where you might just be talking with your friends and someone might have something for sale. The same thing happens with wildlife in the same way. Um, and so just around the world, we've seen these animals move online. And so my role is to uh, make sure that pangolins and their parts aren't being sold through these online platforms. And the goal there is, um, you know, if wildlife traffickers are unable to sell these products online, there's a lot less uh, reward for them to, you know, go out and, and poach these animals and, and traffic them. And so these are examples of some of those um, leather products I was talking about. We have the, the leather boots here on the left. Um, you can really see from this middle image here what that pattern looks like. Um, and that, that's what we, um, our team and I have been trained to kind of look for these individual patterns when we were searching online um, and sellers are putting up pictures of the product. We can kind of, um, you know, quickly pick up the, hey, that, that comes from a pangolin. And then also just an image here from the top right of one of our very uh, talented internal photographers just showing what those scales look like up close. So to give you some information about how WWF is working to keep pangolins and other um, endangered wildlife offline, um, I wanted to show a video from our Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online. Wildlife trafficking is second only to habitat loss as the biggest threat to species. 
Each year, over 20,000 African elephants lose their lives to the demand for ivory. Every day in South Africa, three rhinos perish at the hands of poachers for their horns. And though you might not know what a pangolin is, over one million have been traded in the past decade. Now wildlife traffickers are exploiting the biggest marketplace in the world, your phone. They can reach more people more anonymously than ever before through websites and apps at your fingertips. Instead of roaming the jungle, tigers are placed in online shopping carts with just a few clicks. But you can help keep tigers, elephants, and other species offline. The Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online unites global tech companies to work together to keep their platforms free of endangered species. Help us by learning what to look for, avoiding illegal wildlife products, and reporting suspicious listings. Is this necklace what it seems? Or does it tell another story? Join us to find out. So this is our Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, and this is a project that I spend most of my time on here. Um, our team formally launched this um, partnership uh, in 2018 to kind of bring tech companies from all over the world together to help tackle this issue. Um, so a lot of platforms, they didn't even know that, um, you know, that their, their sites were being used to trade illegal wildlife. Um, and if they did, just kind of didn't really understand, you know, how do we detect it? How can we um, keep these, these, these animals offline? And so we've brought all these companies together. We have 37 across the world right now. Um, a lot of them, the big names you all might recognize like Facebook, um, Google, eBay, Microsoft, um, as well as some of the really big um, companies based in China, which is really important from a demand perspective. And so we work with all of these companies um, very closely to help them um, you know, train their staff so their staff know what to look for. So some of those um, sample products I showed you, um, you know, help them have the right, like help them tune in so they know what to look for there making sure that all companies have the same policies. Um, so while the traffickers know they can't sell these products on any platforms kind of across the web. Uh, we have a really cool volunteer program um, where users can help us um, kind of report these products that they find online. Um, if you're over 18 years old, uh, we're working to help make um, AI and machines smarter so that uh, computers can automatically detect, um, you know, that these pangolin listings when they go online um, and help us block those before they can even reach a buyer. Um, we're educating users because a lot of people don't understand that products come from these endangered species. Um, you might not know if you're looking at those cowboy boots that they came from a pangolin, uh, especially an animal that's you know, on the other side of the world. So really just helping users understand not to buy those products. Um, and then working, making sure that uh, the tech industry, everybody's working together kind of as a team um, to keep these products offline. Um, and to date, we've, uh, companies have blocked or removed um, over 3.3 million listings for illegal wildlife products. And a lot of these, a significant portion are for pangolins. Um, we've, we've kind of worked on pangolins as one of our um, main focal species, um, just because of that, the high demand for their products and you know, the, the severity of, of the threat to them right now. Um, and also it's been helpful for us that companies are able to kind of more easily detect um, that little pattern, that triangular pattern that they have. So a very important question um, is how can you help pangolins um, for those of you listening today? Um, so you can shout from your rooftop about how awesome pangolins are and share everything that you learned today. Um, or if you have neighbors that would not appreciate that, um, you can just uh, share this information with your friends, family, teachers, um, you know, everyone that you, you come in touch with. Let them know what a pangolin is, um, why they're important to protect, why they're threatened, um, and make sure that everyone knows not to buy any products that are made from pangolin parts, um, particularly again here in the U.S. like those um, leather cowboy boots. And I invite you all to check out to um, WF's Wild Classroom program pulled together an awesome um, educational toolkit that you can find on our website, um, which has even more information about pangolins um, and some even more, um, you know, some cool graphics from Lynn here as well to check out. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you all again for, for tuning in today um, and invite you all to ask some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gia. We are going to get started on the question and answer portion now. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so we're going to dive right in. Uh, just a reminder, those of you that are watching on the website, if you have any last questions uh, for Gia, make sure to put them in that chat box. And for our two classes on screen, have your questions ready. Uh, Ms. Humphrey, if you're having any audio 
problems, you can always send them um, through the chat to me and I will ask them on your behalf. So to kick it off, let's take a question from the chat and then we'll go to one of our classes on camera here. So apparently there were a lot of questions that came through wanting to know how many pangolins are there left if you have kind of a ballpark figure there, Gia. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And this is where I invite all of you um, when you're done school to become scientists and help us find a way to count them. <laughs> um, these pangolins are very elusive, as I mentioned, so they're really difficult to find. Um, and also being nocturnal, it makes it difficult as well to kind of track their movements. Um, so there really isn't um, any information on the exact number that's left. We do know that populations in Asia have been more heavily exploited. Um, so traffickers are now moving more into Africa um, to, you know, traffic those species because, because there are so, so many fewer in Asia. Um, but an exact number does not exist to my knowledge. If we can track one down, we'll post that on our website. <laughs> okay, let's go to Ms. Baker's class. If you guys are ready for your first question, go ahead, unmute your microphone and make sure you ask it nice and loud for us. Why do, ping, why do people take pangolin scales for medicine? Why do they think that the pangolin scales are good for medicine? That's a good question. Um, in certain cultures, it's believed um, that it does cure a lot of these different ailments. Um, and while to my knowledge, there isn't scientific um, evidence that confirms this for, for a lot of different um, species, um, sometimes these beliefs are kind of rooted in someone's cultural belief and identity. And so um, it's something that they truly believe will help them. We're gonna go back to the chat now. We have a question from Natasha in Louisville and Maya from Olympia. They wanna know, do pangolins shed their skin or their scales? Oh, that's a really good question that I actually don't know the answer to, um, but I think that'd be a fun one for us to, uh, to look up and get in touch. Okay, it looks like we have another one. Let's do one other from the chat and then we'll go to Miss Humphrey's class here. Um, Clara would like to know, what is your favorite part about working at WWF? Oh, I love this question. My favorite part about working at WWF, um, it's definitely the people we work with. Um, I've been here for seven years and I'm always learning about kind of new projects that we're working on. Um, even people on my own team, I'll hear stories of what they're doing in the field, like testing polar bear poop to kind of track their movements or crazy things that I didn't know like you could really do. Um, so definitely just working with a lot of experts doing really cool things around the world and, and really being passionate about what they do. Great. Okay, Ms. Humphrey, if you want to try your audio and ask a question, um, we can see how well it comes through here. If you want to turn your microphone on, otherwise you can uh, send it through the chat, but we want to make sure to give you guys the opportunity to ask your question. So if you want to go ahead and try it. All right, we're going to try. So many kids want to know how big they are when they're born and how big do they get. Okay, Gia, did you answer that? I did. How big are they born and how big do they get? <laughs> so I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I can kind of do one of these if that's helpful. Um, or if you check out this full size guy behind me, um, they are smaller. Um, so they've been confused with some other, you know, animals. Um, but generally, they're probably let's say a medium sized dog when they're full grown. <laughs> um, and the same size as like you would think of other mammals when they're coming out, you know, quite small. We did have um, an image earlier on of, of one hanging onto the back of its mom um, that you could kind of get, a, get an idea of the size there. Kind of related to some of these number questions here. I know you love the number questions. <laughs> Um, a lot, we've gotten a lot of questions in the chat of people wanting to know what their life expectancy is. Another great question, actually. Um, I don't know the answer to that myself. Um, another one we can definitely look up. Um, you can also check out the IUCN specialist group on pangolins. Um, their website, they have a bunch of information. Um, it covers a lot of their like physical traits. Um, so you can definitely look that up um, now or we can you know, circle back with more information after the session. Perfect. Okay, Miss Baker's class, if you guys are ready and want to ask another one, we're ready for you if you want to unmute your microphone.
Go ahead. What happens if a poacher um somehow gets into the websites that you guys are using to block or remove all the websites for, for all those poachers and and they um if you guys blocked blocked them they unblocked them or they brought them back can they hack the system that's a great question yes so um like you all might know it's, it's pretty easy to kind of create profiles online and delete them or change them you can have fake names you can have silly names um wildlife traffickers and poachers can do the same things so oftentimes if we help identify a listing or a seller um, that we know is, is you know, trafficking high volumes of these animals, the companies will block them or take them down, um, but they can create a new profile. Um, so we're constantly playing a game of, of whack-a-mole as we refer to it, um, kind of trying to track the path of these traffickers across platforms. That's one way it's nice that all of these companies are working together because we can let them know like, hey, there's this person that keeps popping up on this site and they're moving across sites and creating new profiles. Um, to kind of look out for that same seller. And we do also work with law enforcement. Um, so if we see kind of a repeat seller that we know is really trying to you know, traffic these animals, we can pass that on to law enforcement um, and then they can open an investigation. And two, I think, so one thing that we do through this work is we collect a really long list of key search words that um, sellers will use to try and get around company filters because they know they're kind of smart too and they know companies are looking for things. Um, so those um, pangolin leather cowboy boots, we see those sold online as scaly anteaters. Um, that's what we would call kind of like a key search word. And so we share these search words with companies to kind of build into their automated detection system so that they'll pick those up immediately. Um, but the sellers will catch on that companies are looking for those as well. So we're constantly having to stay fresh, make sure we know what the new search words are and that we're keeping companies updated. Um, and then two, just kind of an important part with that as well. Um, so we have those, you know, those true wildlife criminals and traffickers that are trying to sell these products. We also do see listings that it's just somebody selling something they maybe found at a yard sale um, or something their grandma had and they didn't, they didn't know where it came from. Um, so those aren't the sellers that we would really pass on to law enforcement. It would just be those that we know are, are really trying to traffic wildlife. What a great question. <laughs> okay, we have Mrs. Gosselin's fifth grade class from Maine watching on the webpage and they have kind of a two-parter here. So the first question is, what are some of the pangolins predators? And is there a reason their tongues are so long? <laughs> Good question. Um, so predators, um, kind of like I, I had mentioned, um, those big cats like a lion for the African species, um, a tiger for the Asian species, um, which is why they have those, you know, hard coats of armor to help, you know, penetrate from from big claws. Um, excuse me. But then their number one predator, of course, would be humans <laughs> right now. Um, and the long sticky tongues are to help them kind of like reach down and really get at those ants and termites um, and different little bugs that they're trying to collect. Um, so if you think of a frog has a nice long tongue too to help them grab it some flies, it's similar to that. Okay, Miss Humphreys class, if you are ready for your second question, we'd be happy to have you. Um, if you want to try your audio again there. That is really hard to hear. Can you try one more time just a little louder for us? We are having a really hard time with the connection. Um, if you want to just send the question in the chat to me, Ms. Humphrey, and I'll ask it on your behalf in just a minute, we'll come back to you. Um, we'll take another one from the chat while they are doing that. Shaden from Louisville would like to know, Gia, if you have ever seen a pangolin or held one. Huh, I have not. I think seeing a pangolin is probably at the top of every conservationist bucket list. <laughs> um, again, because they are so elusive, um, you know, even those, those of us that, you know, are fortunate enough to make it out into the field, it's very difficult um, to see one. And I, I, I wouldn't want to hold one um, just to not, you know, promote them, you know, getting too attached to a human, but there are a lot of um, rehabilitation centers that, that do have to take care of it and, you know, nurse, nurse those young that have lost their mom. 
kind of go off of that question, there's another question here um, that is kind of related. They would like to know if there, it's Maya and Briston. They wanna know if there are any pangolins in zoos. Oh, I want to say there, I think there might be one in the US that has one. Um, I don't wanna misquote that, so I'm not gonna name them. Um, but I, I do know that they don't do very well in captivity. Um, just because they are so used to being so elusive. Um, I don't think they're one of those species that would do very well. Um, I think the one I'm thinking of, it, it's a it's a reputable and a good zoo. So if you do happen to find where they are, um, you know, it's, it's a good one. But I think as a general rule, they don't do too great in captivity, which is why um, conservationists are working so hard to help protect the species and prevent them from, you know, their numbers getting so low that they would then have to, you know, move into captivity. Okay, I got the question from Miss Humphrey's class here, and it's a gr it's a great one. They would like to know, kind of, what is the punishment for trafficking pangolins? Do you go to jail? Do you get fined? What is the punishment? That is an excellent question um, with a very big and confusing answer. <laughs> so it varies uh, completely by country. Um, so there are some, um, you know, some countries where the penalty is just going to be a fee and you're on your way. Um, some where you're going to have a fee and jail time um, that might not be that long. And then some where you might just be going to prison and paying a lot of money. Um, so that's one thing, too, that we do kind of try and, um, you know, work with and advocate for is, is some more um, uniformity um, for prosecutions. Um, and in the U.S., um, penguins are protected. So they're protected globally under CITES. Uh, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Very long <laughs> um, name for a short acronym there. Um, but because they're protected under international law, they're also blanket protected here in the U.S. Um, through the Fish and Wildlife Service. So there would be penalty here in the U.S. for trafficking them. Um, I don't know the exact, um, you know, like fee or, or prison sentence you'd be looking at. Um, and again, that would kind of vary as well by jurisdiction, you know, the residing judge and all of those things. Um, but those that do traffic in pangolin scales um, particularly in those like large quantity numbers, like that box of scales I showed you, um, you're looking at some serious prison time. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple from the chat and then we'll go back to Miss Baker's class. So we have Audrey in Kentucky that would like to know what is the most endangered animal that you have met in your career? Oh, most endangered animal I've met? Probably, hmm. I would say it'd be a form of bird species, perhaps in Costa Rica, but I think the elephant is a big one and a really important one to call attention to. Um, those, the elephant I had showed in my video there in Thailand. Um, elephants are another one that have really been hit hard by this illegal wildlife trade. Um, they're in demand for those, you know, they're long, beautiful tusks. Um, there's a big trade for those that are carved like into trinkets or figurines, also some jewelry. Um, and it's still estimated that about 15,000 um, African elephants are poached each year for their, for their ivory. Um, so even though elephants are one I think people are more familiar with compared to a pangolin, um, they're still ones that are really in a lot of trouble and need our help. Okay, this question from Logan in New York is another good one. Do pangolins help the environment? That's a great question. Um, so yes, all species um, have a role to play in their own ecosystem um, and making sure that the ecosystem is healthy. Um, so whether it's a big, um, you know, like a keystone species or a big predator, like a, like a lion um, that helps to regulate the food chain, penguins do the same thing. Um, they play an important role too by, you know, eating other things in their own landscape, helping to pass like, you know, seed dispersal like an elephant would do, um, maintaining soil quality through their, you know, their little digging. <laughs> um, they all kind of, every species has a really important role to play in their own ecosystem. Miss Baker's class, if you're ready, we are ready for you. Go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask your question. Hey, so since you have convinced these fourth graders in Ohio that yes, they're on board with this trafficking of wildlife and they responded just after this much education. So from you going to these other countries and talking with people, are, have people in the other countries with their cultures being different than ours, have they been as responsive to respond to this act to stop the trafficking of these animals as we have, as you hope we are all going to be here in the U.S. then too. Has it been the same? Great question. Um, so yeah, WF does do a lot of demand reduction work in other countries um, where they know that the demand for these products is very high. 
Um, a lot of this work to date has done, been done for other species like elephants and rhino horn and some others. Um, so we don't have necessarily um, direct like concrete campaigns I can point you to right now for other countries. Um, we have seen, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard um, that there is a potential link between pangolins and COVID-19. Um, where a pangolin is one of the animals that's suspected to be the intermediary host of COVID-19. So this means that um, the disease would have passed from, you know, the original species like a bat through a pangolin and then to a human. Um, this hasn't been proven, but it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of correlation there that has gotten, you know, people, people talking. Um, and China is one of those company or countries where um, pangolins are consumed as a delicacy. Um, and the country has stepped up and done a lot to already um, kind of ban and prohibit the use of pangolins um, in a lot of ways. So we've seen some great results from that already um, with a lot of people paying attention to, you know, the severity of something that can be linked to a zoonotic disease. Okay, let's go back to our chat here. Lucy from Alexandria would like to know what you or WWF does to protect pangolin habitat. Oh, that's a great question as well. Um, so WWF does a lot of work to protect um, habitats, habitats, habitats globally um, in Africa and Asia where these animals live. Um, and it's kind of through you know multiple different projects and operating at different levels, um, making sure that the actual like land where the animal lives um, is conserved and protected and not, um, you know, cultivated for development or, or any other thing like that. Um, but also making sure that the communities that the animals live with um, know how to live with them. So a pangolin is not one that'll have necessarily as much conflict as something like a tiger. Um, but WF does do a lot of work with those communities. So like in Asia, if a tiger is wandering into a community because it has um, less habitat to go look for food, it's going to check out this village that has some something smells good, something's cooking, I'm gonna come check it out. Um, and then you have conflict between the two and, and danger to both of them. So WF does a lot of really cool work to help prevent that. Um, and by working on that, it also helps protect the pangolins um, habitat as well. These questions are on point today, Gia. Um, <laughs> Friday, guys. <laughs> next one come through from Joseph in Arizona wants to know if pangolins are able to camouflage. Great question. Um, so they don't change colors. They look like they might have like a cool little like gecko chameleon thing going on. Um, they don't do that, but they actually blend in pretty well as you can see from this image here with their surroundings. Um, whether they're in the kind of like down in the dirt or kind of up in a tree, that, that color will kind of blend nicely to blending in. Okay, I'm gonna ask our next question from Ms. Humphrey's class here since they're having some audio um, issues. And their question is, do you actually help catch the traffickers? Do you know if the cartels have anything to do with the trafficking of pangolins? Yes, so we do WF um, and our partners at Traffic, which is a, an organization that I work as, with as well, um, that focuses specifically on um, wildlife trade. Um, we do work to help actually identify these criminal networks. So uh, one important uh, piece to explain with this illegal wildlife trade is it is linked to um, highly organized crime. Um, so if you think of the same, you know, bad groups that are selling um, drugs or weapons um, or kind of the other, you know, horrible things, um, they're also selling wildlife. Um, so it's not something that um, I don't think, you know, your teacher is doing <laughs> from, you know, her classroom kind of thing. These are like big organized syndicates. Um, and so we do work to kind of help identify, um, you know, who's at the top of these syndicates, who's organizing this, um, because if, you know, if, even if you're just kind of, um, you know, catching a poacher, you know, those same, they're going to go hire someone else to poach the animal, right? It's a much bigger web that is, um, you know, established. So we want to know um, who's involved at the top, how are they transporting these animals? There's a very complex supply chain that's set up to do this. Um, that does tap into those other criminal activities. Um, so, you know, if that if there's a plane that's transporting drugs, they're going to put the wildlife with that as well. Um, so we do do a lot of work to make sure that we can catch those criminals and prevent um, the animals from being poached in the first place. Um, so that we're not just looking at, you know, the animal in transit or helping prevent someone from wanting to buy it, but making sure that no one can, you know, actually poach it in the beginning. Okay, let's do uh, two others from the chat that I'm gonna kind of tie together so that you can answer them together and then we'll go back to Miss Baker's class. We have Brielle from New Jersey that wants to know what is your favorite animal? And kind of along those lines too, um, Joshua from California wants to know why do you like to study pangolins specifically? 
Okay, great questions. My favorite animal, um, I'm a big bird nerd. I love to watch birds at my own feeder. I love to go out and look for birds as they're coming through for, uh, you know, spring migration. So every time I've had the fortune of traveling, I'll always kind of keep eyes out for birds. Um, my favorite species, which we can all see locally here in the US is an osprey. Um, they tend to be found kind of like on areas with water. Um, and they're just, they're beautiful birds that are also fierce predators when they, you know, dive for a fish. So I think they're really cool. Um, and as far as penguins, I just think they're so fun to study because they just look like little dinosaurs and it's so cool the way they just roll up into a ball and um, they're just really cool animals that really need help. Great answer to a great question. Um, Miss Baker's class, if you guys are ready, whoever is our question asker here, go ahead, unmute and we're ready for you. Okay. How many species have you saved? Oh. How many species have I saved? Whew. I hope a lot. <laughs> I don't think that's a number I can help to articulate. Um, I can say WWF has been working um, for over 60 years to really help, um, you know, the most endangered species all over the world. And we've done a lot of really cool work with really cool teams and other partners um, to help make that happen. Um, we can say if you look at a trade like, um, so even let's take the elephants, for example, uh, with an estimated 15,000 poached, um, you know, each year, that number used to be 20,000. Um, and rhino numbers used to be higher and tiger numbers used to be lower. Um, so there are things that we've seen a lot of really great progress and that do take time. Um, but we're seeing a lot of great strides to keeping these animals safe. So I think with that, I can't give you an exact number of species saved, but I can tell you we're working really hard to save them all. <laughs> Okay, we have just under five minutes left. So we are going to try to get to as many questions as we can. We still have a lot left here, but we're going to do our best. Um, Moni in Illinois wants to know, where is your favorite place you've ever traveled? Oh, favorite place I've ever traveled. Ah, it might be a tie. I really loved Costa Rica um, and in largely because of the birds. There were birds everywhere um, and those howler monkeys, they really did sound like dinosaurs, which as I mentioned before, I do love dinosaurs. <laughs> um, and I think Costa Rica is just a beautiful place where they're doing a lot of cool conservation management work. Um, and I'm someone I love both um, mountains and uh, ocean and, and forest and everything in between. So it kind of nicely brought all of those together for me. Another great question come through from Adeline at Low Elementary wants to know, are pangolins and anteaters related? Are they in the same family? They're not, but that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure you if you all have gotten to yet in lessons plan, but they, they look similar because of something called convergent evolution, um, which I invite you all to kind of go look up and check out after this. But they've evolved in a way that they look the same, um, but they actually are not related at all. Okay. Um, just a reminder, Ms. Humphrey, if you guys have any last questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll try to sneak one more in here from you guys. Um, let's see. We have quite a few left here. Um, a lot of kids are asking, a lot of them want to know, maybe we can just kind of reiterate here, Gia, how they can help. Absolutely. Um, so it's so important to kind of spread the word about all these animals um, and that they are endangered and that their products um, are for sale. Um, so even a lot of people with elephant ivory don't understand that the ivory comes from an elephant or that the animal has to be killed in order to get it. Um, I spoke with someone at one time that thought maybe the elephant lost their tusks in the same way that we lose our teeth, which isn't true. Um, so really just helping people understand, you know, you shouldn't buy these products. They come from these endangered species um, and that there's a really big trade behind it. Um, so really just helping spread the word is so important. And of course, don't buy these products if you see them. <laughs> Kind of related to that, since we're talking about it, um, Cadence in Milwaukee was asking if there's a certain age you have to be to help pangolins. So there's no age. Anyone can help a pangolin. Um, anyone can help us spread the word and anyone can say no to buying their products. Um, we do have some cool programs, as I mentioned, if you're over 18, where you can help us report things that you see for sale online. Um, but if you happen to come across something, um, you know, that you see online that maybe shouldn't be there, you find a grown up, find a parent um, or someone over 18 that can help you um, report those. But I think the most important thing that you can still do is just let everyone know about pangolins. Um, because before this year, really, no one knew what they were. Um, when I would say pangolin, people would think penguin. Um, they've just never really heard of them before. <laughs> 
Okay, um, we are almost out of time. So why don't we wrap up, Ms. Baker, if you guys have any last questions, do you have any more questions? Looks like I see some hands. <laughs> if you wanna pick one last question, we'll, we'll round it out with you all. How are the boots made? The boots made. Where are the boots made? Was that the question? Yes. Okay, great question. Um, so a lot of the cowboy boots that I've seen for sale online are coming from Mexico. Um, and an important piece there to flag is prior to 2016, there was a legal trade, um, like legal, not illegal trade in pangolin leathers. Um, after that, pangolins were fully protected under international law and you, there was no possible legal way to trade them. Um, so one thing that we see is um, where these leather makers were legally making boots up until 20, 2016, um, that they maybe had extra leather in supply once those new laws kicked in. And we, we did see kind of an uptick in those boots um, where maybe they were looking to kind of offload um, all the different leather that they had. But there would be sellers or, or kind of designers and makers all over the country, all over the world. Uh, but a lot of the ones that we see online, particularly concentrated in the Southwest, are coming from Mexico. Okay, I want to be mindful of the time and everyone's schedule. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. I know a lot of you still have questions that we did not get to, we didn't have time for. So what I would recommend is ask your parent or teacher to email them. They can email them to wildclassroom at www.fus.org. And we would be happy to pass those along to Gia and try to get some answers back to you. I appreciate all of you watching and contributing such great questions. I wanna give a huge thanks to Gia also for spending some time with us and teaching us all about these really, really cool animals. Just a reminder to teachers and parents, I'm gonna share my screen here. If you are looking for more educational resources on pangolins. If you've got some pangolin enthusiasts in your family or your classroom, we do have additional resources available over on Wild Classroom. You can find all of them there. We have a Kahoot trivia quiz that we created to go along with this presentation. Kahoot is completely free to use. It's a quiz platform. You just head over to kahoot.it and enter that game pin that you see on your screen. We also have that information on the conservation in the classroom classroom website under Wild Classroom where you can access it there. Like I said, all the questions are about Gia's presentation, so be sure to check that out. You can also find the Lynn the Pangolin activity toolkit on Wild Classroom also. There's a fun little slideshow as well as some activities that you can do in the classroom or at home, so be sure to check that out. Classrooms that are on camera, if you guys want to unmute your microphone so that we can say goodbye. And thanks so much for being here. We will yes, see we you next time. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for joining. It's really great to see all of you. <laughs> I think they're muted. <laughs>